Thanks uh, for coming to this evening's event. I know that it's uh, around first paper and midterm season. Um, so for those of you who have sacrificed your A plus in order to come to tonight's event, thank you. You get an A plus from me. Um, before we start, M many of you who have been coming to the events know the general routine, which is to say that there's the poetry reading and then uh, a Q&A afterwards with the visiting poet and then a raffle. Um, those of you who have put your name in a little piece of paper and put it into that very valuable silver bowl, um, someone, Hillary Gravendike will stir it around, and she, if she pulls your name, you get a book of your choice, and Ted Pearson hopefully will be willing to sign it for you. Um, two announcements on Halloween, October 31st. The next of the Holloway Poetry Series readings will take place, presenting uh, Amiri Baraka and Michael Bigley. Um, and then on <coughs> November 15th at uh, 6.30, the, the Baraka event is also at 6.30. Rachel Levitsky and Jillian Osborne will be reading. Tonight's event will um, begin with a reading by Su Kyung Lee, and Su will be introduced by Dan Blanton, who's on the faculty here, professor here. Um, and then Charles Legere will introduce <coughs> our guest from, not from UC, um, Ted Pearson. Um, so, and then after that, I'll come back up here to facilitate any Q&A that might be desirable. Um, so, let's begin, Dan. It's a great privilege for me, though it is probably something of a peril for her, that I have been asked to introduce our first reader this <laughs> evening, uh, Su Kyung Lee also hoping to uh, win the raffle. Um, Sue is a graduate student here in English at Berkeley, cradle of poets, of course, as we're regular re regularly reminded in the uh, Holloway readings. She arrives in Berkeley <clears throat> in the transit of Dante in exile from that other great cradle of poets on another shore, from Whitman and Williams to Baraka and Muldoon and Springsteen, the great state of New Jersey, as she puts it, or at least as the website did, <clears throat> by way of Swarthmore and the greater Philadelphia metropolitan area, cradle of all sorts of other things. Her poems touch lightly on these sites and others, I think, but only to frame a much larger distance, <clears throat> a bit like the painting by Degas at the Philadelphia Museum of Art that you'll hear about that won't quite submit itself to analysis or sympathy or term papers, trained instead on the gap or opacity between things one can realize in prose <coughs> and the unruly, smaller, occasionally frustrating things that remain somehow just out of reach and have to be shown in verse instead, like, if I may quote, phrases of wistfulness awkwardly realized in alphabets. Or like the mnemonic distortions induced by Barbie doll footwear, what more menacing and yet incomprehensible universal could there possibly be? Or like the limits of hearing imposed by Indo-European languages. These are merely instances, as someone once said, even if they are sizable ones, but I think you will hear what I mean. Sue's poems have a knack for memory and a healthy skepticism about it too, since it usually doesn't fit anyway, and that's what's interesting. Her poems know that, indeed retain a bemused capacity to, know, to not know what they don't know and to find something in what's missing anyway. They meditate without mulling, lightly reducing demonstrations to demonstratives, all in order, according to a phrase I love, quote, to free the edges. The line I most want to quote, though, comes not from one of these poems, but rather from an email <clears throat> in which she explained how we come to be here tonight. Quote, when Hillary asked me to read, says Sue, my reaction was, how'd you know I wrote poems? Who sold me out? It's a dirty secret, really. I'm not sure who that double agent might have been, but the secret is out and an open one now, and fortunately so for the rest of us. So it is not only my good luck, but also yours, that I now introduce you to Su Kyung Lee. Wow. Thank you. That 
that was great. Um, not sure if I can match that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, the bath. On afternoons sluggish as this, eyes disheveled, shoulders wound tight. The thought of public baths lingers all day. At 2.30 p.m., the only visitors were unaccountable women, too old not to have children to take care of, too young to be massaging their legs at this hour. Their gowns stuck to their wet, sweaty backs, their white, stocky calves peeping under their gowns. They are breathing heavily, wiping in unison the sweat bead over their lips, grunting the way only childed women can, deep and airy. The fire is on. We all climb into the clay kiln. The kiln, as big as what a hut might feel like, is dark and unbearable with hot, dry heat emanating from some unknown underground source. Huddled around the center, there's something fundamental in this unspoken intimacy with a handful of strangers, all but naked except for the arms crossed over the legs. With the brash candor that comes with being middle-aged, with having large brown nipples, a woman exclaims, look how taut her skin is, and all stare at my taut, naked flesh. Eh, young is good, huh? I smile, slightly nodding to think their comments. True, my young, taut, naked flesh does contrast with their flimsy, venous skin, unbearable, un unable to bear the heat or the probing. I pull open that small Alice in Wonderland door, enter into light. In the fluorescent room, women are playing cards, betting petty <coughs> money, eating noodles while watching daytime soap on TV, getting a facial, a body massage, a body scrape, waxing, threading, manicure, pedicure, this habitual obsession with the body. The kiln seems to be empty now, except a woman in the corner. No si sound save that small pantings and the sighs whew, every 10 seconds or so. Then suddenly, you gotta open your legs to let the steam into your womanhood. I stare at her, early 50s, maybe even mid 50s. In the meanwhile, she's been explaining the science of steam in the womanhood. I awkwardly uncross my legs back out the door. Confucius, a fool and a political fool at that, set up cumbersome relationship codes between elderly and youth, partners, friends, ad infinitum. Even after centuries of that clothing, naked bodies remain defenseless, wanting to be scraped, exfoliated, peeled, stripped of yet more layers. Stretched between his words and our naked desires, my body, unable to metabolize so many vis-a-vis, -vis, flushes out all the contradictions as sweat that drips to the floor and commingles with other sweat. Arguing over those wet burlap <coughs> sheets, gluttonously detoxifying the body, then filling it with oily noodles, we are at home, these naked bodies strewn across the public lounge, and I, I'm laid bared next to another soul. We exchange neither words nor glances. This is a strange time of estrangement, spent sniffing others' odor. I once wrote a paper on Degas' painting in the PMA, after the bath. A woman steps out from the tub in the left, with her back to us, leans across the bed to wipe her back. It was a long-winded paper about the painter's violence <coughs> and the figure through his brush and such things. For sure, the women had brushed me with some homely nosiness, jabbing, poking, penetrating into the skin of my youth. But I hadn't felt the coy isolation that the figure had felt. Unlike her sensually curved back, presented, mine was slouched over with sweat merely there. Had she bathed for Degas, for the men Degas wanted to show his paintings to? Middle-aged women, what do they bathe for? Sweating all the sluggish afternoons out, grunting out daily grunts, putting some good, hot steam into womanhood. Am I going too fast? Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, <clears throat> the unfairness of non-Indo-European language, i.e., 
El sonido de mi ciudad is evocative and atmospheric, even for a non-understander, but, i.e., du ron pyo it nun nun, that's just nonsensical, especially for an understander, to see phrases of wistfulness awkwardly <coughs> realized in alphabets. What is there to describe in any case? That leftover chill, yellows the patches of growth to match my dog's fur, my dog's name, Toldol, is quite whimsical, that Sonamu evergreen is as knotted as the joints of an index finger of coarse women who spent at least 20 years raw watering in the dives of street fairs, that the breath of drunk 20 somewhat steam up in fermented anxiety, unemployment sake when they blow into my tumbler. In middle school, we were taught collage, discardable photos of forgotten relatives and teen magazine ads, ripped sometimes by hand, by scissors. Instinctive at first, be attentive to the edges, juxtapose the images, the puzzle pieces. Look, surprising repetitions of shape, the tight white bun over the nape of a great aunt, circles over her atrophied arched back, turned against a city girl's tanned curve of her right thigh over left. Glue the ladies with sensitivity, now seal them in with decoupage. But even to an untrained 13-year-old eye, the picture is disjunctive, incomplete. So I took it apart. First, wet it a bit to loosen up the glue, then, with an exacto knife, lift up the stubborn connection. <coughs> Be decisive with the blade, don't hurt the original image, but make courageous cuts to free the edges. It's impossible to undamage them, all messy now, rips, creases, and black glue smudges. Some make unwasted collage, knowing exactly which image to choose, how to cut without phrase, or how to align so the untrained eye will marvel at the real seeming scale, coherent <coughs> color. In short, images appealing for others, not a bunch of dried hags poxed by Elmer's glue scabs. Rather, images of lost countries, fatherlands, their sense of sea, sewage, roasted grains, or taste of tears of war that breaks all apart, sounds of street vendors, illegal red tapes chasing down the block, particularities of folk chants, or mothers doing this or that, their two-dimensional pains in their hands. Regluing is as shameful a business as gluing, separating the unglued images, forcing them to return to their original ads and pictures, to blot out the glue stains, not even a mishap collage, not even overlooking the blatant rips and creases. Okay. Um, return home for Frank Bedart. The legionnaire returns home after his proud serve with his whiskers groomed to impeccable precision, pointing like a boat. As he smokes, he puckers crooked on one side as if smiling, and his ship topples ever so slightly with the upwind. His whiskers, groomed to impeccable precision, point there to the boats. He inherited nothing from his father save that crooked smile like pucker. His own ship, unsurmised by the sea's upwind, now topples with the end of war, for he's forced to return to his father's passive boat in the dock. He inherited nothing from him, really, just that crooked smile like pucker. Not the chipped front tooth, not the misbuttoned vest, not the stale tobacco smell. As he's forced to return to the godforsaken boat appointed in the dock, he curses the old man standing by the dock with his crooked chipped smile, full of chipped front tooth. But not the misbuttoned vest, not the aged passive smell, but the exact angle of the crookedness, its inheritance he despises. He curses the old man standing by the dock with his chipped smile a boat. That is a smile in this case, a despised, unwittingly welcoming smile. But how he despises <coughs> that exact crooked angle, its unwelcome welcomings, its inheritance. As he exhales his smoke toward the old misbuttoned man, he puckers his crooked smile. That is a bitter pucker in this case, an ambiguous, unwittingly misunderstood pucker. 
The legionnaire returns home after his proud serve without his crooked smile. Um, the next one, uh, the title is a quote from Adrian Rich's uh, 21 Love Poems, where she says, I kept making a text of you because I wanted to explain you to others, wanted others to understand you and see you as I had seen you. Okay. One, the first time you saw a sea anemone swing in shallow sea. Two, the moment I touched the center of its supple spikes, it flinched, shriveling, ploop, in less than a second. You squealed, it's like your asshole. Three, guanabanas were in season then, lining countless blocks with supple green spikes. Its flesh white and creamy, and you could taste the sugar granules. In fact, you told me your tongue mingled with its particles. Four, You'd spit out guanabana seeds as you walked, leaving a trail that would lead us out to Mecca. Five, onto the volcanic rocks, you climbed up there throwing pears and apples down at us as if to say, this is the proper way one goes about bruising a fruit. Six, you were tyrant Roxanne on the balcony to us wooing you with our nose or other body parts. Seven, on the volcanic rocks, the diver lady sprawled in her <coughs> muumuu, cut up a still alive sea mackerel flapping its fins and handed me its supple, suave flesh. As I peel the white scales off her knife with my tongue, eight. We eat hokoli, she heckoed us and har har laughed her way into overcharging us. Nine, everything the crowd, the rocks, even the sushi lady, melded into an endless echo of ya ya, ya ya, ya ya. 10, there were clefts being made all over, in the fruits, in the sea, in her face. 11, your face was dwarfed by the giant vintage sunglasses we found in the rock cleft. 12, under it, your June nose sat small and buttoned the way we all did under one of countless umbrellas in Kimyong, while you alone were buried under its black sand granules. Thirteen, soon you had to scurry out of your black sand tomb to put my shorts on because there were spiked hair surfers riding the water. Fourteen, while the white bikini gold skin city girls of sudden swank her tried to throw revolution at us. Fifteen, we laughed at their future with Kim Young's blistering sun. We had the know-how to shelter our creamy supple flesh under a box t-shirt. Sixteen, but trailing behind them into their Mecca hotel buffet. Seventeen, we knew you didn't want to feel like a local seed. You had your bikini under my shorts and tee and wanted to take them off bad. Eighteen, but I felt in place this June, guanabanas, umbrellas. Moo -moo. And still, I wanted to take him off you bad. 19. Let's to the river instead. We'll be ditching the mollusks, and the eels won't be as welcoming, though. 20. No more overcharging. We'll slit our own share of whitewater fish till the river runs dry. 21. But instead, there we were, paddling in shallow sea amidst countless diaphanous sphincters floating in shallow sea. Um, and the last one is a little excerpt from a, a longer section. Okay. <clears throat> in May, Yellow forsythias lined the walls all around our school, back when it was called the People's <coughs> School, not elementary. Gaunt cosmos men loomed about us around the time gaunt five-petaled cosmos fluttered in every concrete crack, blowing crumbled leaves at us. My brother, all I do these days is miss people, though not particularly anyone. At night, gazing at my body, my pores, my holes, missing those in them. I'm looking at my own flesh, longing for it. Right after August, we caught endless dragonflies between our fingers until shadows fell across our apartment. Ones in the bottom of the net crushed by the weight of others, making me an accomplice to your insecticide. Coyly cornered under the elaborate pillow fort you'd built, I'd wait. You always played the part of an old dying soldier. 
You returned bleeding, I bound your wounds, then saw you off again. I always played the part of the waiter, waiting for my blood flesh to return to our fort, dark and cushioned. Because just sitting, we were complicit. Thank you. It's an honor to introduce Ted Pearson. Thank you very much, Lynn, for inviting me to do so, asking me to do so, I mean. Um, he's the author of at least 15 books, uh, and he works mostly in the form of the long book-length poem, uh, Evidence and Songs Aside, collect at least 14 of these works, and the, his most recent encryptions has three more in it. To introduce him, I want to say a few words about what his poetry looks like on the page and what it's like to read it. Pearson's 1989 book, uh, Descant, poem Descant, consists of 24 quatrains, each with a page to itself. I'd like to read you just one of these quatrains from sort of early in the poem. Eyes ire augured in added hours, a tantrum's trope avulsed, the trumped shill gloms a reet demean, or semblance of naught in vacuo. In a 1995 line break interview, Charles Bernstein asked Pearson what this poem, Descant, was about. Pearson answered that it was about 10 minutes. <laughs> Pearson's response, a parry with an inveterate punster, as Bernstein is, plays on two meanings of about. But for a moment, I want to take this response seriously, so to speak, and use it as a window into the function specifically of time in Pearson's poetry. I think that Pearson's poetry is just as much about the experience of reading the poem, the experience of the duration of reading it, as what the poetry might or might not say. Like a piece of music, his poems demand to be recognized in their existence in the moment. Even if at first blush, Pearson's poems don't make one kind of sense, syntactic or logical, eyes ire augured in added hours, a tantrum's trope avulsed, the trumped sh shill gloms a reet demean or semblance of not in vacuo, they do make sonic or rhythmic sense. They ask you to hear. But that's not to say that a word in Pearson's poetry is just a sound, as if there could be such a thing, like the much dreamed of cipher, when I read T Ted Pearson's poetry, I become conscious of the way that I, at the moment of reading, collate sound and, and significance or sense. Plus, and this is something you can't sense at what we call a reading, ironically, I don't hear, just hear Ted Pearson's poems, I see them, or I see what is not them. The quatrains in Descant, for example, are surrounded by and sometimes broken up by a quantity of emptiness. Each one is on a page. The space on the page helps us notice the weight of the individual word, its seriousness. Like George Oppen, Ted Pearson is a patient poet. He weighs his words very carefully. So even though Descant is, as Ted Pearson says, about 10 minutes, it's also a record or trace of the care that went into the writing of it. Descant makes these different experiences of time, that of the reading and of the writing of the poem, simultaneous. Thus, Ted Pearson is a disciplined dis and reassembler of language and time. When we read these pieces, broken apart and strung back together, we read causality into succession, the poem is the moment and innumerable others. So then, to justifiably linger on one of the lines from Des Descant that I read, the semblance, the, excuse me, the semblance of not in vacuo, or the making of something out of nothing, is, I think, another way of saying what his poetry is like. Ted Pearson's semblance of not is a lot. The seeming of nothing is an abundance. So please join me in welcoming Ted Pearson. Thanks, Charlie, and thank you so much to Lynn for the opportunity to come home after many years. Uh, it's very lovely to see new faces and new folks, and uh, especially lovely to see many dear old faces and old friends and so many fine poets and writers in the room tonight. Um, the best audience one could ask for. Um, did I have a note? I did. 
1975, uh, I began a project called The Tunes Image, uh, which took 30 years to complete. It's either a very long book or I'm a very slow writer. The smart money says I'm very slow. Tonight I want to read uh, four of the 18 poems, serial poems, that make that book up. Uh, one from Songs Aside, which is the third movement, and All of Encryptions, which is the fourth and final movement. It'll take about 40 minutes to do that, and uh, then I welcome your questions and comments. I'll do my best. Sound check, we're good. Everybody comfortably hearing? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Hard science. Quote, you cannot solder an abyss with air. Emily Dickinson. And so they came to the shining city, the burning city, the entropic city, an arcanum devoted to punishing choices, as ingress of fact, as desolation. Steal away or start stepping, magnetic north, perchance to dream a social fabric of many colors cut and stitched on the bias. Gilded phalloi in a rare heroic greet the dawn at river's edge where civic virtue at a deep discount lights these straits and narrows. If how things work is what things are, demolition is progress. Watch our dust. While elders raise their hands to praise a landmark writ in rubble. The verb seeking to be was to animate, not to annihilate. In those days, they had eyes for visions. Keep the peace, bozo. A pyrrhic hard-on tops the charts, low-rent booty in high erotic guise. Such is the curator of scars surmise, coming home from a psychometric binge. East of the sun, the utopic choir musicates to the tears of things. Thus, if you break it, you buy it, sings the eponymous widget in falsetto. The climate they fled was never the weather, but the very streets they walked on, who cut their losses, burned their crosses, and beat their boards into timeshares unspeakably modern, by choice or chance, how a city dies when you leave it, while raggedy revenants sweep the streets for the inclement angel of the supplement. A dope climate, summer and a spoon, easy living from pipe to mouth, where the fish are high, and the cotton's jumping, and it's sleepy time up south. Designer shackles ready to wear, cerements sewn from bloody rags, a Glock's spiel requiescat tolls a populace bagged and tagged. History's fables will not suffice to revive these products of chaos and ice, as if anything native to this place could grow here. 
spin that doctor. Justice gropes a hung jury. The fixed idea dozes. The defense rests. Incremental ironies glaze the galleries. A gag rule chomps at the bit. Bread and slaughter, a plenary indulgence. From venture capital to virtual cash, snake eyes herald a new regime of passwords and panache. Erect ray seams, grainy flow of lichen, ranunculi set in perpetua. The melody mimics the order of bloom, whose quit claim frees das Ding. So the city tires of the poet, his idols of love and death, the bare limbs of trees in winter, the young in early spring. Tangible assets, wow and flutter, legs for days and endless nights, a karmic sutra in erotic sexameter, or hardcore dithyram early to rise. The mirror decodes a mated pair. Autonomy hums in the tain. A toccata for tongue in a red sector. My one vice, my other. The page demanded a topology of drift. Morphs in section, fleeced verbatim, for a few gross of broken lines, for a full-blown recantation. Stones in my pathway, a prosody of place, refractive in season to make this plaint, and raise a mojo hand to paint. A griot's gri gri in grisai. Memory racks the geosyllabary. Limbs inscribed on catastrophic stone. Impaired faculties gloss the ejecta. Vesuvial sunrise, archival ash. Urban renewal. Buked and scorned, the eminent domain of ghosts, whose music echoes coast to coast from the shadows of the alleys of paradise. <clears throat> a vacant lot, a piece of string, memento mori, these foolish things. A tree where late the yard bird sings in the aureate aura of orature. The tree falls, or it doesn't. You hear it, or you don't. Contingency plans, a party, or a wake, either way, it's dead. That was a portrait of Detroit where I recently spent nine years. The rest of the reading um, will be devoted to the fourth and final movement of the virtual large book, um, which is called Encryptions. Um, three pieces. The movement itself begins with an epigraph from George Oppen. I think there is no light in the world but the world, and I think there is light. <coughs> Phase rule, quote, 
We are suspended in language. Niels Bohr. Day breaks on the last man standing. Memory factors blood from a stone. Oblique benisons, a topology of mourning. When the sun rises, it comes up red. From chimerical bond, excuse me, from chemical bond to chimerical weave the fatality of a distance that closes and comes at last to what was first bred out and then bled out. Portions of this childhood were pre-recorded in the far-flung nursery of stars. A warp in space-time shrouds the infinitive to see that my grave is kept clean. The bent day sings its declination. <coughs> if you lived here, you'd be dead by now, lost in the penitential logic of ruins, where the chill is father to the flame. Reason's regent retrofits the dreamscape Angelic accents explicate the lack. Ghosted notes requite their begetting. The mask is a series of masks. Dead leaves drift on parochial breezes. Local tongues tell the local time. Destiny's dispatch, duly inscribed in the annals of a blue sky scam. Silence shapes a mordant remix, phantom entries, throated gaps. In time, each name discerns its root in the death of the thing it names. Impossible music. Visible scars, in centered chords from beaten brass, the anarchy of production masks an infinitely small vocabulary. Last words pass from hand to mouth, the mechanics of emphasis, blanc de blanc. Clear eyes hear what's read by ear as toxic zeros <coughs> in solution. Belcanto nullities hedged on account, their indentured outcome to encrypt. One-time ciphers from the axis of digression to the axis of perturbation. Chaos delights in dreams of order. Quandam et futura on Lethe's shore while structural theorems sent in lieu of girders to rut with giants. The order of battle, in omni patrii, parses et filii, the human remains, displaced personae of poetic extraction, but only the ghost is holy. Chronic oblations repro the repros. From restricted access to mystical conceit. An explanatory fiction, elective trauma, or commotion resurrected in futility. <coughs> Eros, abscanditis, extant glyph in the absence of visible means. An indexical scherzo cribs the manifest, content of his emprise. Agency disperses then in real time. Tools that are no good require more skill. 
the product of these uncertainties, is the constant of our faith. A cupped harp conjures two trains running, flat to the correlate, nowhere fast. The edict says what the exile knows. The point of departure is to leave. Vultures circle a corporate campus. Deer trails eulogize terraced hills. The ardent equity of an orphaned libido, in paraphrase, funds its futurity. With patient syllables, Our Lady of Sorrows dispels the falsities of each next dawn, not least the happy measure of our days as facts in the fictions we have lived. This week's novices weed the residuals, culled from the shadows of their doubt, a constant curriculum of Sturm und Drang to turn this mother out. Penile dementia, tricked out riffs, a botched apex in the cryptic sublime. Under the sign of a genital economy, whose heat is adjunct to its light. The grayscale weighs its season's affect on condition of anonymity. Advanced decomposition, un pratique sauvage. Remember to breathe when you dream. Majuscules pledge their antic allegiance to a bitmap of Trajan's column, while cut stone crumbles to pixel dust, the code sleeps in the sun. Virtual warfare, opposable thumbs, the necropolis or empire in repose, whose acolytes orbit an urban agora in lockstep to limb their theodicy. Flat earth follies in the moral menagerie, where FaceTime chronicles a horse's ass, rots mute racket, the anti-lyric, the horizon placed in evidence. New years gone into old habits, Singular enough for piecework, heir to a tombstone disposition, born of a graveyard mind. Attitude adjustment, three second burn on the stump between ways and means. What one word won't, what any will do. Correct me if I'm not wrong. Shadows bruise a virgin palate. Two tears set the margins of this grief. The subject stalked by a predicate felon to the ragged edge of the page. Prosthetic prosody, anaerobic angst, descants the romance of the road, a deceptive cadence in digital delay, cloud, chamber, music. Gender adorns a red dilemma in the polynomial perverse. From stepwise melody to cemetery plot, recumbent roses, rampant thorns. A rogue wave mounts a demi-quaver for a money shot by proxy, while anachronous others chart the depths of ancestral ruts to drown in. Eyes surmise what's bared in the scan, paratactic rebates, pyrotechnic hooks, 
mind-forged manacles of simulacra to gird the republic of the dead. Hell is for seekers of the haven sought by the fires of the city of the poem called Thought, gleaned in the glow of game scintilla, gone to glad extinction. The world as will, a double negative, bears its device in the court of miracles. This is the interval where nothing precedes the nothing that surely follows. <clears throat> Dark matter. Quote, less language than music, less syntax than songs of words. Hélène Cizou. By stealth and by starlight to traverse these confines, with all their harmonies may be infinite, as desire is and is not disaster, as the subject is a void of dispersion without portfolio, forever mapping the distances these confines are and decline to admit. Fractals on the B side of the geologic record convene to illumine an astigmatic score, leading the conductor to vacate the podium and approach a window or abyss of importunity through or to which lightning bolts. The Logos deposits a fire in the hole, whence to extract the prima materia that is the currency of fools. This, or so we imagine, is a reckoning, as if there were anything beyond consumption after the fire is gone. The mortal remains of our due diligence impel us to canvas this ruined landscape, to compose these gathering clouds, beneath whose ages DJ Fatwa clogs the bloggeries with utter preposterphies and a self-serve soupçon of hypoplastic jive. A calculus raised on paradox displays of all that is the minimum of all that is and isn't perceptible from here. For all we know, it might be paradise, whose fictive brilliance fails to pierce the maximal dark of our days. Huddled for warmth, against the insurgent ghost wind with its patriarchal chill. Nerve ends burn at each next trophy's cut and course from borrowed longings to the proximate verge of a fatal techne that signals their demise. Viva la muerte, though none the wiser. Morpheus morphs the available stock of all too human bits, thus to extend or limb a genealogy from party favors to party discipline. Who's your daddy? What's your line? Invention falters in a glut of dittos Gravity gathers extruded days, and the implicate order of prevailing winds 
determines the praxis of hand and eye, there to display and sum our misprisions, for which no assembly is required. <coughs> Sifting the middens by epical inches for the prodigal spirit of sublimity. To every demand its hecatomb, to every lack its desire, where the least we can do or sacrifice to is too much and never enough. Labor labors to escape its end and means to annotate every star that underwrites its fate. It is at best a wintry mix of chores and chattel whose bitter repertoire spurs the warlords to table futurity while the crocus publishes its descent. Of the world and its double, caput in situ, iterable elements tally the years now lost to the memory of moments, as if all that remains of the will to change is a codicil that says, we are dead. The elders recall the historical subject, stuck in traffic on the Via Negativa, and a patrimony lost to a discourse of rights that can only serve to defer the arrival of hope and the trope that it rode in on. <coughs> From bread and water, to body and blood, a metabolic gloss on a transubstantial end game. Prayerful regimes of very form ilk claim each malediction as the registered trademark of a value-added scourge in simulcast. <clears throat> Refractive to the diurnal blight their daily walk inscribes, <coughs> vertiginous shimmers of shot gray silk drape modernism's skin of glass. Whence, from his airy, the local boss clone posts an agenda in a pixelated bottle on a bootleg plasma screen. A strange hysteresis exists in the transport of language by language to language, where squalor breeds necrotic stank distilled from common if unheroic stains and slyly rebranded for a tourist economy as the latest eau de vie. <clears throat> Unable to combat the inertia of language, anxious biophobes search for signs of life amidst the life of signs, e.g. ribbons of exurban asphalt that link faux chateau and designer trees to define the ambit of a cul-de-sac. Excuse me. Homo economicus trades on denizens increasingly inured to the wholesale price of rank immiseration, spanning the antipathies of have and not. The exchange rate apparently favors the sacral smoke that rises from their hovels. A caress brought forward from childhood's ledger, soothes raw flesh and buffs what's left of sacrificial stone, there to indict in the brutal light of consensual amnesia what little remains to show or tell what make-believe 
believes. If cessation of desire is the end of suffering, it is to that end we suffer. And yet, we can find no forwarding address for those who exist on the margins of a state that extols each death for cause. Funereal rites redress no wrong, though we find ourselves in a different century, in a different part of the object world, where even the terrible war is different, and nothing we suffer the loss of is lost until it is lost to memory. The lethal seed in the mise-en-scene encrypts the grammar of a green profusion. Why? Because it can. Because it cannot help itself. While here, in a grove of self-same difference, icons of renewal faintly flicker, flare, and fade away. As bodies at work on bodies of work, we are heirs to the empire of the alphabet we were born to and which escorts us to the archive of bones, unable to name there what we have become or to praise the silence that surrounds us. The final, and I'm sure you feel blessedly shortest piece, is called Null Set. <clears throat> Quote, the book is often described as a tomb, Jacques Derrida, and to his memory. In the cloistered light of a winter sun, the elements speak of things undone, while a singularity or ill-starred die is cast in futurity elsewhere than art, unable to recall the other it is and cannot know itself to be. Thus, that forgetfulness that is the human that defines itself in extremity. Tired of appearance and disappearance, the caesura marks what might be otherwise, estranging and estranged between tropes whose rumored gaps reveal the pyrrhic muthos of presence by fits and starts but has no part to call its own in whatever art might claim it. Beyond knowledge and the reach of eyes, the horizon retreats to untold revels, while an aging exile empties his pockets before the walls of the visible city, a bevy of mathemes attendant shades, and a corpus constructed of glacial derivatives confirm his departure is his bequest. Unlikely as it seems, the years carry over to burden the topos that we call home, to which we address these psalms of negation in which we encrypt these remnants and revenants of the common catastrophe that befalls our mother tongue at home in no man's land. Not the embrace, but the encounter is decisive. Where the word and the wordless arise as from death and meet to invoke a topology of being whose form is a form of love made plain by what spirits are 
or say they are. When hauntology interpolates phonology. <coughs> Difficult as ever to speak of paradise or the errant angel of the supplement. That curve of breast, those canted hips, whose contours in their stark relief delineate our days. Such are the signs of a dispossession we endure as in an anguish of mortality and take as emblems to our wounds. The narrative founders on mythic scarps, Utis, the cognomen of an antic rift, where uncanny blossoms run a gauntlet of air and open the living past to risk, not least the risk of that disaster where in the memory of what will have been proscribes any present occurrence to memory. As above, so below. Even in hell, the dead keep busy. Given that thought is no longer thought of death, nor death the death of thought. And we, who else would beggar death, breathe their words as if our own, and lend to them a living tongue to tell and to remind ourselves of what we've left undone. A little madness goes a long way, though every step be a further step into madness. And to know this, whatever it is to know, is to know this in advance, in light of which we find what is as it is impedes what might be otherwise, unless we retreat from madness. Breath equivocates where once it praised a tradition that lives on borrowed time. The figure at issue in the nexus of art is the continuity of song made strange, which is not nothing, but for that nothing, it would fill in making whatever remains to be made there in its name. The wind in the wires is also song, of which no words survive, as what was written must now be written over and over in the archive of an image that approaches the threshold where each next word <coughs> comprises the motley we are and evermore shall be. Thank you so much. Uh, offered to do the A's to Q's or the R's as in response to your C's as in comments. Um, so C and R or Q and A, anybody want to offer a C or a Q? <laughs> yeah, Barbara. <laughs> and 
Any other? Try exhausted or um, you got papers to write. Yeah. So the question is, what is Ted Pearson excited about reading these days? <laughs> I am struggling happily and eternally with uh, the work of Alain Bédou, uh, French philosopher. Um, f I'm not particularly equipped to understand Bédou, but um, it's infinitely challenging to me. So that's keeping me very excited and up late. Yeah, Brian. I'm a little afraid to ask a question. I'm going to anyway. The work is so careful. I feel like maybe a little confused. But I just wanted to ask you it's not so much a question, but just I'd like to hear if you have any thoughts or just hear you speak a little bit about the mix of registers in your work, in particular, kind of the use of very contemporary types of language. So the, the, the question or request was for some comments about uh, tonal shifts, um, semantic shifts, code shifting in Ted's work. That's a lovely question, thank you. And obviously um, something I'm very interested in trying to do. Um, an inadequate beginning answer and, but first let me explain why it's so inadequate and why you shouldn't be shy if you feel like asking questions or making comments. I've been writing for a while and um, since 1964. And my average completed work right, per year is 1.2 words a day. Okay, so I'm real slow. Not lazy, but slow. Which means, I, I, don't be awkward because I live in awkwardness, you know. This is, this is the result of lots of awkwardness that gets less awkward a little, day by day, okay. Um, it doesn't spring full blown from any head I would recognize. Um, as far as registers, uh, semantic shifts, code shifts. <clears throat> My early training was as a musician, and I, I came to writing from that, uh, music and composing. And um, I find layering very interesting, like dense chords. Uh, it works differently, of course, in language than it does in music, which is relatively free of of signifieds, right? So, I think there are class components. I think there are social historical components to different registers. And it's partly a way of acknowledging both historical and contemporary different class, regional, ethnic, ideological positions, um, which often occur in phrases and vocabularies. And I want to invite them to the table. I want to vex them, you know, sometimes. Uh, I want to honor them sometimes. But I certainly want to be in conversation with them. Does that help a little? Great question. Yeah. What? Um, it, it, it ends that book, yeah. The 30 year, the 31 year book, yeah, it does in that. This book does. Um, it's in four movements, the book, and um, they roughly range from the first movement, 75 to 80, the second movement, roughly uh, 81 to 91, the third movement, 92 to 2002, and encryptions the last three years, 2002 to 2005, and so. 
maybe someday. Now, all of that work in one version or another is happily in print, um, serially published along the way, but um, the first 16 years are extensively revised. So hopefully someday, um, it's, it's actually not huge, um, but hopefully someday you can see it as, as the book that I hoped many years ago to live long enough to finish. You know? so, yeah. Um, George is asking how conscious I might or might not be of um, using puns as shifting rhetorical semantic logical frames within, within the work. And um, again, I, I hope I'm pretty conscious of it. Um, I, 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 aspire to mind, I aspire to mindfulness and um, Maybe the one thing I have going for me is that if you're only working two words a day, you can take time. I mean, it's not like I write two words and, you know, go party. Um, it, it, turns, it turns out words have this endlessly long um, social and intellectual history. And once, once a word asks me or invites me to, to put it on the page, then I feel just obliged, like you would with any new friend or potential hookup, to learn as much as you can about it before you know you take that next step. Questions? <laughs> um, any? Maybe one last comment or question, or we can do the raffle, and then hang out here a little bit, look at Ted's books. I know that the ASUC bookstore, who, uh, which has been incredibly kind about providing books by our visiting poets, is always grateful for sales. Um, so. As are independent small press publishers. If you like work that you hear, mine or whoever, most of it's going to be coming from love projects, okay, independent publishers, so you're actually supporting them. If it was my money, I'd just give you the books. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, say thank you to Sue and to Ted. Um, thanks to all of you for coming tonight. <laughs> <laughs>